Lord, thank you for this time that we have together. We pray that the word would be taught clearly. We pray that you would give us understanding hearts to believe the truth. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Many of the modern versions will change that verse, and they will change rightly dividing, and they'll change it to something along the lines of correctly handling or some other wording. Obviously, the the King James wording is the correct wording. It says to rightly divide because it is necessary to divide the Scriptures because the Scriptures say different things in different places. So get with me Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So in Genesis 1, 29, the Lord is clearly prescribing a vegetarian diet, it uses the word meat, but of course the word meat sometimes has the sense of food. So Genesis 1 is a plant-based diet. Look at Genesis 9 verse 3. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Genesis 9 is obviously an omnivore diet. It's every moving thing that liveth plus vegetables. Look with me at Leviticus 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. So let me ask you this. Did those verses all say the same thing? Which one of those verses is correct and which ones are wrong? They're all right. Well, they don't say the same thing. Don't those, don't those verses contradict one another? One says, eat a plant-based diet. One says, eat a all animals and plants, and another says, well, some of the animals are clean and some are not. Now, those three bodies of information are not the same. So, does the Bible have errors? What's the explanation? <clears throat> Time and place. If I say I'm going to have lunch with you on Wednesday, and I'm going to have lunch with you on Thursday, is that a contradiction or is it not a contradiction? It's not a contradiction because the information is given to different people. So the first thing we looked at, if you look at the chart, Genesis 1 was given to Adam. Genesis 9 was given to Noah. (coughs) Roughly how far apart in time are Adam and Noah? Very good, 1,656 years. The Leviticus was given to Moses. Now, here's why this matters. I don't know if you ever heard this or not. When I was a young Christian, someone said to me, the Bible is God's love letters to man. And so, you can read anywhere in there because it's all about you. And doesn't that sound nice? Well, all of the Bible is true. And all of the Bible is for our learning. 
But is all of the Bible written for the same man's obedience at the same time? It's plainly not. <clears throat> there are different instructions given to different people at different times. So what are the instructions for us today? Look at me at 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy chapter four. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter four, verse four. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So first Timothy four says every creature of God is good. That's most similar to which of the three instructions we looked at. One, one answer was Moses. What else? Noah, right? Every moving thing that liveth sounds like every creature of God is good. So one of the things this tells us, do you need to live under the Old Testament law today? You don't, because Leviticus 11 is the Old Testament law, and 1 Timothy 4 is clearly different from Leviticus 11. Now here's what happens. Most people get that because they get there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And what people typically think is the New Testament is all for me and the New Testament is all the same everywhere. What most people think is that what Paul did is he came along late because he was stubborn and ornery. But when Paul got saved, what Paul did is he did the exact same thing as Peter and the Twelve. Look with me at Galatians 2, verse 7. At the typical wedding, what does the preacher say after pronouncing someone man and wife? What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, is that, is that, is that a good scriptural pronouncement? Yes. What is also true what God hath put asunder, let not man join together. If God says two things are different, it's wrong to join them. Yes? That's true. Look with me at Galatians 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now here's the trickiest question of the day. Are circumcision and uncircumcision the same? How can you tell? What does un mean? Not. So is circumcision and not circumcision identical? Uh, it can't be. What most people have been taught is there is only one gospel and everyone throughout time is saved the exact same way. People in time past were saved looking forward to the cross just as we are saved looking backward to the cross. That's just religious jargon. How do I know that? Look with me at Mark 9. I'm actually skipping ahead of myself here, but here we go. Mark chapter 9. Look with me at verse 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, 
he shall rise the third day. What Pauline passage probably has the clearest summary of the gospel by which we are saved today? 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And then in verse 3, he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And then he says this, How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So 1 Corinthians 15 summarizes the gospel as Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's how you get saved today. Now read verse 31 again. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. <clears throat> That's more or less what 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 says. I realize it doesn't say anything about the burial, but it talks about the Lord's death and his resurrection. Now read verse 32. <clears throat> but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Now think about this just for a minute. What you're reading in Mark 9, this is during the Lord's public earthly ministry. In other words, it's within the three years immediately before the cross. His disciples, the ones that he's teaching, he flat out tells them, I'm going to be killed and rise again the third day. And what does it say they understood? They had no idea what he meant. So were the 12 preaching the Lord's death and resurrection? They, they cannot have been. Remember when I did that really good play acting? You know, people in time past were saved looking forward to the cross, just as we're saved looking backward to the cross. It, it, no, not according to Scripture. If you want to believe that because you just like cute, quaint sayings, then fine. But that's not what Scripture says. Look with me at Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Obviously, he's talking about his death. He's talking about his resurrection. Verse 34, And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. See, that verse tells you three different ways that they didn't understand what he was talking about. Now, I realize people say that there's only ever one gospel. It's always the same. People in time past get saved the same way we are today. It's just absolutely, utterly false. Let me show you one more time. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verse 9. And let's go to verse 1 first. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So in John chapter 20, we are after the cross, and we're not only after the cross, what else are we after? The resurrection itself. Now read verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now I want you to just follow along with me here for a minute. We saw in Mark, we saw in Luke, 
where the Lord specifically tells the disciples. He specifically tells them, I'm going to be killed and rise again, and they don't understand it. Then he does it. He's killed, and he rises again, and you know what? They still don't understand it. Even after the resurrection, they did not understand the Scripture that he had to rise again from the dead. So let me ask you this. Did the 12 preach the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15 at any time during the Lord's earthly ministry? It's simply not possible. Even after he rises from the dead, they don't understand what happened. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. That verse gives you the Bible definition of what a mystery is. What a mystery is, is it's wisdom that is what? Hidden. Which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When verse 8 talks about the princes of this world, who is it talking about? Harry, William? No. It's talking about what Ephesians 6 calls the principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now think about something with me if you would. Although the disciples before the cross did not understand the cross, was it revealed that Christ would go to the cross and die and be resurrected? It was revealed because the Lord spoke of it. While the disciples did not understand the cross and the resurrection, did Satan understand the cross and resurrection? He did. When the Lord says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, he says that in John chapter 2. Does Satan have an understanding of what's going to happen? He does. Does Satan have an understanding that Jesus Christ is going to die for the sins of Israel? Matthew 1 says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save, and what's the next two words? His people people from their sins. So let me ask you this. If you are right before the cross and you understand what the scripture says, what would you understand Jesus Christ's death to accomplish? You would understand it to accomplish the redemption of Israel. Now you wouldn't understand it to accomplish anything about the body of Christ, you would understand it to accomplish the redemption of Israel. Read verse 8 one more time. <clears throat> so verse 7 talks about the mystery, the hidden wisdom. Then in verse 8 it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What Satan did not know is he did not know that the cross would purchase the redemption of the body of Christ. Get with me Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to make the following statement and you can decide whether or not this is true. Ephesians 3 
demonstrates that Paul received new information not previously known. And the failure to understand Ephesians 3 is a great obstacle to people's understanding of the New Testament. So when people say that Peter and Paul preached the exact same message, when you, when you say that, what you then require yourself to do is you have to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you have to take Paul's epistles, and you have to take Hebrews through Revelation, and you have to take them, and you have to somehow make them say the same thing when they don't say the same thing. And it's like putting a square block into a round hole. Now, one of the things, I'll say this, and you can decide if this is true. One of the things that happens as you go through Christendom is you're taught again and again and again how to massage the verses to make them fit. <clears throat> Remember when we started with just the issue of diet and it says different things in different places? Well, the Bible says a lot of different things in a lot of different places. And that's why the typical Bible teaching today says things like, the original Greek says, a better translation would be, what the verse really means is, and people are forced to do that because they have two verses on the page that say different things, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to say they somehow have to mean the same thing. So they have to massage this verse here, and they have to massage that verse there. But when we look here at Ephesians 3, if Paul actually has new information, then it must therefore be different. In other words, if it's, if it's the exact same thing, then it's not new, right? So look at me at Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. If you teach right division, sooner or later someone will say to you, dispensationalism was invented in the 1800s by John Nelson Darby and Schofield and so on. And what they'll say is, until 1800s, no one knew anything about dispensationalism, and then some people just made it up, and it got popular. The word dispensation has been in the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's been there because it's the literal translation of the underlying Greek word. My point being, was dispensationalism invented in the 1800s, or was it always there but simply ignored? See, here's what, here's what God has done. He did this sneaky thing and created a Bible and he hid all this truth in it. And then men ignore it and they say, well, we can't find the truth. Yeah, because you don't pay any attention to where God put it. Now look at verse 3. Well, before we, let's look at verse 2 just for one more second. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. So it was given to Paul for him to distribute to others. What that should remind you of a little bit is an Old Testament prophet, or particularly Moses. Why did God tell Moses to go to Mount Sinai? Because God was going to give him the revelation of the Old Testament law. And when Moses received the revelation of the Old Testament law, what was he supposed to do? Tell it to Israel, right? Now, by the way, we won't spend the time to do this. But if you ever sit down and you look at Moses' life and Paul's life, Moses was a murderer. Saul 
was a murderer. Moses was delivered by a basket. Paul was delivered by a basket. And if you go through and you look at all the similarities, you know why God designed it that way? The great revealer of the Old Testament law is Moses. He was given that information to distribute to mankind. Guess who's the great revealer during the time in which we live? It's Paul. Look at verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Did Paul understand the teaching that Peter gave to the little flock? He did. Let me just pause on this for a moment. When Paul persecuted the kingdom church, was he doing that because he didn't like Jewish people? Why was Paul persecuting the kingdom church? It was because he was zealous for the Old Testament law and he viewed them as heretics. Well, for him to view them as heretics, he had to know what they taught. He wouldn't have viewed them as heretics if he didn't know what they taught, right? So now read verse 3 again. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. You cannot say logically, you cannot say intellectually, honestly, that Peter and Paul were preaching the same thing when you read verse 3. Because Paul didn't need revelation to know what Peter was preaching. He already knew it. It's the fact that he knew it that was causing him to persecute the kingdom church. He looked at their teachings. He said, these guys are heretics, and they need to be stamped out. Well, when Paul says that he got something by revelation, it has to be different. It can't be the same thing. He already knew that. Now, let me prove this further. You ready? Look at verse 3. Let's pay attention to the parentheses and then see what it says. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now notice verse 5, where it says, which in other ages? That's modifying the word mystery. So this mystery, which in other ages was not made known. So again, everyone in time past was saved looking forward to the cross, just as we're saved looking backward to the cross. What does verse 5 say? Which in other ages was not made known. Well, if it wasn't made known, then how did they know it? They didn't. Notice with me verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We're coming back to Ephesians 3, but get Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan. When it says she's a woman of Canaan, what is that telling you? She's a Gentile, that's right. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, capital L, Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Does the woman of Canaan understand who he is? She does, doesn't she? Verse 23, But he answered her not a word. When the Lord did that, was that a sin? Someone says no. Why was it not a sin? 
Well, Jesus Christ didn't sin, right? So it couldn't have been a sin. Was it rude or uncouth? Let's keep reading. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. So in verse 24, he makes clear the reason that he didn't answer her is that he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and she's not one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So she continues on. She says, Lord, help me. Now notice what he says in verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not meat, it's not fitting, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What did he just say about the woman of Canaan? He's saying she's a dog. Now, today, of course, he would have been sued. Now, again, to state the obvious, in verse 26, did the Lord Jesus Christ sin? He, yeah, he, he can't sin, right? So it's not a sin. But what's going on here is look at, the, look at the chart in time past. Is there a difference between Israel and Gentiles? There is. And Ephesians 2 specifically says that in time past, Gentiles were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. In other words, the state of Gentiles in time past was very bleak. So he says to the woman, she's a dog. Verse 27, And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Get with me Acts 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 9, Acts 10, 9. On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, this is Cornelius, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now, when you read verse 12 there, what verse that we looked at earlier did it make you think of? What verse did it make you think of in Leviticus 11? In Leviticus 11, it says, These are the beasts which ye shall eat. These are the beasts which ye shall not eat. Now read verse 12 again. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. So Peter has a vision. There's the great sheet let down. And there's all of these beasts, including unclean ones. And what does the voice say to him in the next verse? And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. What, what Peter's doing here is, the Old Testament law has been in effect for 2,000 years. It says, don't eat unclean animals. Peter receives a vision that says, eat unclean animals. So what does he properly do? What do you mean? Are you serious? 
I mean, I, I know what Leviticus says. I can't eat an unclean animal. He doubts in himself what it should mean. Verse 17, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made enquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So while he's pondering this, a Gentile shows up at his door. Verse 28, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an, what word does he use? Unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So what's going on here? In Matthew 15, the Lord refers to the woman of Canaan as a dog because at that time there is a middle wall of partition between Israel and Gentiles and she's properly a dog. In Acts chapter 10, Peter, who is the leader of the kingdom church. Now, here's what people think, by the way. In Matthew 28, when the so-called Great Commission is given, and it says, baptize all nations, people think, well, that's the marching orders for today, and the Lord told the twelve to go baptize Gentiles. Is that true? What does Peter think ten chapters later? He literally says it is unlawful for him to go unto a Gentile. So don't tell me the Great Commission is about going to Gentiles. Because the person who received the commission 10 chapters later says it's a violation of the law to go to Gentiles. What happens in Acts chapter 10, by the way, what chapter does Paul get saved in? Acts chapter 9. So Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9. What God does in Acts chapter 10 is, well, I need to tell, since I'm starting the dispensation of grace, I better tell the twelve that something is changed. How am I going to tell Peter that something is changed? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a Gentile to his door, and I'm going to give him a vision that tells him three times that Gentiles are clean. What that tells you, was Peter going unto Gentiles in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9? He wasn't. If you'd suggested it to him, he would have said, it's absurd, you're asking me to violate the Old Testament law. Now, I say all that, go back to Ephesians 3, 6. Ephesians 3, 6. Now, in verse 3, it talks about the mystery. In verse 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known. And verse 6, it says that. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Is that what the Lord taught during His earthly ministry? Is that what Peter believed in the book of Acts? He didn't believe anything of the sort. Now, I realize people say Peter and Paul preach the exact same thing. But in order to believe that, you have to deny what the verses say. Verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of God, the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Verse 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So God specifically gave to Paul the grace to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We're coming back to Ephesians 3, but get John 5. John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Here's what I want you to notice. In John 5, the Lord is is dealing with people that do not believe his teaching. 
And so what he says to them is, search the Scriptures. When the Lord says, search the Scriptures in John 5, what Scriptures is he talking about? Has to be the Old Testament. So when he says, search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. The people he was talking to thought they had eternal life from the Old Testament. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. In other words, here's what he's saying. You guys claim to believe the Old Testament, but if you really believe the Old Testament, search it, and what conclusion would you reach if you really believe the Old Testament? I am the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And if you don't believe it, it's because you're not believing the Old Testament. So just state the obvious real quick. The Old Testament tells you that the Christ would be from the tribe of Judah, that he would be the seed of David, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. It has all of these things, right? So if you actually read the Old Testament and believed it, what would you think when Jesus Christ of Nazareth showed up? You would realize, well, we know who this is. There's dozens of clues, right? There's no one else who it can be. Here's what I want you to get. What the Lord says in John chapter 5 is search the Scriptures. Now get Ephesians 3.8. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. That I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. So what Paul preached, can you search it out in the Old Testament? It's unsearchable because it's not there, because it is a mystery which in other ages was not made known. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now notice this next part. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hitting God. How do you get around that? I realize people want to say Peter and Paul preach the same thing. What verse 9 specifically says is the mystery that was given to Paul from the beginning of the world was hitting God. So how are you going to tell me that Isaiah knew that, or Jeremiah knew that, or Peter knew that? You you, you can't. Verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. This is the last point I'll make. Verse 9 says to make all men see. Verse 10 says to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The prophecy program is about God's power. What God says in the Old Testament again and again and again is, I'm going to do this. So let me give you a simple example. Scripture prophesies that Christ will be from the seed of David. Right? Well, when that prophecy is given, if you're Satan, do you know who you have to destroy? Isn't it the same thing as when in Genesis 3, God says to the serpent that he's going to destroy the serpent with the seed of the woman? And then what do you see happen three chapters later in Genesis 6? Satan and his minions try to corrupt the seed of the woman. When God says to Abraham, I'm going to give thee this land to you and your seed forever, what happens when Israel goes into Egypt? What does Satan do? Well, he puts giants in the promised land because Satan, God tells Satan what he's going to do, and Satan says, thanks. Now I know how I need to respond. 
The prophecy program is about power because what God says to Satan is, I'm going to do A, B, and C. Go ahead and try to stop it. So when Satan puts those giants in the promised land, does the God say, whoo, now, now, now I'm stuck. I, I, I was going to be able to beat those small guys, but those guys are big. So now I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Well, he doesn't say that, right? He doesn't care. He could destroy all of them. The prophecy program is about God saying to Satan, I'm going to do A, B, C, D. I'm going to foretell it all in advance, and you can't stop it. Isn't that so? That's exactly so. All the prophecies about Jesus Christ, there's times where the Davidic seed line is reduced to a few living males. When that happened, was God worried it wasn't going to succeed? No, he knew exactly what he was doing. But it gave Satan an opportunity to try to thwart God's plan. When we talk about the mystery, what is the definition of mystery? Hidden wisdom. Verse 10 says, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2 said, if the princes of this world had known the mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what God did with the body of Christ, the church that God is forming today during the dispensation of grace, according to Ephesians 1 verse 3, is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. According to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Prior to God saving Saul, there is no indication in the Scripture anywhere of the mystery, of the dispensation of grace, of the body of Christ that God will form that will replace heaven, that will replace Satan in the heavens. Do you follow me? When the cross occurs, Satan, in his lust and, and anger and passion, he watches the humiliation of Jesus Christ and his suffering, and he revels in it. Right? Satan was in favor of the cross, according to Luke 22, verse 3, because who did he enter into to cause it to happen? He entered into Judas. Was there any question Satan wanted the cross to occur? He did. But once he realizes with the revelation of the mystery, oh, hey, wait a minute. This is going to form the body of Christ that's going to replace me and my minions in the heavenly places. He says in the Living Bible, oops. He, he doesn't say that. But, but he realizes it was an enormous mistake. And it was an enormous mistake because as opposed to the prophecy program where God said, I'm going to do this and this and this, where he told him in advance, God just kept it a secret. And God demonstrated who had superior wisdom, God or Satan. God did. He just kept one little secret and Satan was his own undoing. So what does this all mean? As you come to the Scriptures, if you do not accept the plain reality that Paul was given new information, that it's a mystery, that it's different from Peter, if you don't accept that, you will spend your Christian life taking things that God put asunder and joining together. And when you do that, you're going to have to make things that don't say the same thing say the same thing. And that's the path to unbelief is what that is. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the dispensation of grace. We thank you for the direct access Gentiles have during the dispensation of grace. 
And we thank you that the gospel is so precious. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did. We thank you that he made eternal life available as a free gift. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to proclaim that. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If we could all stand together. We're going to close with Christ is all that he claimed to be.